All right. Well, it is so good to see all of you this morning. This man, what a difference this year is. Maybe should have considered a couple services, but hey, we're fitting. Um, I, I was thinking about how different it was last year uh, as we were still in the midst of the pandemic. To What a, a glorious thing to be able to be gathered together. Um, my name's Josh. If you're visiting today, uh, I am the, the founding and teaching pastor here at Door of Hope and uh, really grateful that you've come to join us. Um, we uh, just wanted to just mention two things. Uh, there is a 6 p.m. evening service happening tonight. People have been asking if, the, if our evening service is happening. It is. So 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, and then Alpha, for those of you that have been interested in Alpha, Alpha is a, a place where uh, it kind of invite essentially people that are exploring faith or um, know nothing about Christianity. It is this amazing place where you come and you have a meal and you're able to ask questions. And kind of the, the heart of Alpha is that there is no bad questions, that it's a safe place to bring your, your doubts, your skepticism, it's, it's a place where we want you to meet, uh, meet with, with other believers that, that can help you understand what the gospel is all about. And Alpha is an incredible tool. It's powerfully used around the world. Uh, and uh, we're really excited about the momentum that we're seeing there. That's Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. And if you're interested in being a part of Alpha, um, please uh, email Pip, uh, Pip Craighead at, at doorofhopepdx.org. Um, with that said, that's it. Those are the only announcements. I, I'm the king of having other things to say that don't need to be said, so I won't do that this morning. Um, we are going to consider um, a really powerful text, and one that many of us are familiar with, and that is uh, the interaction um, after the resurrection of Jesus uh, with one of his disciples, and that disciple is the disciple Thomas. And we are told that Jesus had appeared to the disciples um, uh, and, and it showed up. And we're told that Thomas was not in uh, with the disciples the first time that Jesus appeared to them. And he's commonly known as Doubting Thomas. And I honestly think that that's an unfair, an, an unfair title uh, that has been placed upon him. I actually think Thomas is quite courageous uh, because he is one who is comfortable voicing, I'm sure, what all of the disciples were thinking and feeling. And so I want to just begin with this kind of understanding of the place of doubt in the believer's life. Now, there are warnings about doubt in Scripture. James says, you know, uh, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. Uh, and he says, but let him ask in faith, not not one who doubts, for the one who doubts is like one who looks into the mirror and forgets what they look like when they turn around. But what James is focusing on is a doubt that is without faith. What we need to be thinking about is the paradox, which actually probably applies to you no matter what you believe, uh, of how much in life we live in this tension of belief and unbelief, how they actually coexist often, that there are things that we believe, but, but we actually worry that it might not be true. And that can be applied to a whole plethora of, of concepts around human existence, but especially when it comes to faith in God. There's a, a, an amazing quote um, by one of my favorite Christian authors, Frederick Buechner, um, who said in his book, Wishful Thinking, and it's up behind me on the screen, whether your faith is that there is a God or that there is not a God, if you do not have any doubts, you are kidding yourself or asleep. Doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. <laughs> they keep it awake and moving. That's such an amazing, <laughs> I was going to call the message the ants in the pants of faith, but it just didn't roll off the tongue very easily. Um, I, I love this because he is pointing us back to what I believe is one of the most honest prayers found anywhere in Scripture. Uh, and that is found in Mark chapter 9, uh, verses 23 and 24. Uh, we are told that there was 
uh, was a ruler who came to Jesus and he, he's begging Jesus to heal his, his son. And Jesus said to him, if you, if you can believe, all things are possible. And the man said a prayer that speaks of this paradox, and I think it's the truest, most honest prayer found in Scripture. He said, I believe, help my unbelief. And I think there is great beauty and power in that statement. One of the things that we are considering today, because it's Easter, is that Easter is Resurrection Sunday. And I, I don't know if you are fam very familiar with the lead up to the resurrection, what Christians hold as an essential aspect of our faith, is that we don't just believe that Jesus uh, came as, as a great teacher about divine things. We believe that Jesus himself is God, manifest in the flesh, that God's entrance into this broken world, and, and it's not very difficult to convince people of sin. It's not very difficult to convince people that, that there is something fundamentally wrong with the world, and at the same time, there is so much beauty in the world. But we feel that conflict all the time. And, and we see it in the city. I, I love the Northwest. I think it's so beautiful. I love our city. I've always loved Portland. Um, but isn't it weird? It's like, I love this place. In the last couple of years, it's also been one of the most maddening places um, to see a place of such beauty that was considered for so long the greenest city in the world. Um, and to see all of the destruction that's taken place. And I'm, I'm reminded of this, of this tension that, that there is this beauty all around me, there are amazing people, uh, there is natural beauty, and then there's the ugliness that comes through the brokenness of the human experience. Homelessness, ra uh, rampant drug addiction, a pandemic that's killed so many. And now war in Europe. There are these things that constantly remind us that it's not as it could be. That's why nobody, we're far more interested in dystopian futures than we are utopian because none of us actually believe that utopia is possible, at least not by the hands of man. And so I think that this, this tension is always at play. And when we come to this, this incredible story, we need to remember that, that we are talking about the God-man who actually entered into that brokenness. That, that brokenness, that frustration of the human existence, what David Foster Wallace called a peculiar American loneliness. It wasn't peculiar and it's not American. It's, it, it is the reality of human existence that life is often impossible. And it is definitely marked by much suffering. It's not all suffering, but it is marked by much suffering. And what that tells us is that, is that mankind is constantly, humanity is always looking for a way to transcend, a way to reach the divine. But the problem is, is that it, all of our attempts to reach the divine in our own efforts has always led to impotence and even greater frustration. And therefore, the essence of the gospel and what makes it unique in, 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 um, when it is placed next to other great world religions is that Christianity, A, is the only major world religion that uh, cannot be, that the founder cannot be separated from the experience of the Christian. It's also the only major world religion in which the founder claimed to be God himself. But more importantly, it's different than religion, for religion by its definition is, is a human being's attempt to reach God in their own strength, in their own effort. As the gospel tells us, no, it's not about man pursuing God, it's about God pursuing sinful humanity. And God in his mercy and his compassion reaches down into our impotence, our inability to reach him in our own strength in Jesus. And we are told that the night of Jesus' betrayal, when he was arrested, before he was crucified, he had much to say to his disciples about what was coming. And he told them the whole purpose of his coming. Here they were, these, these Jewish men around Jesus and, Jesus, and they're like, you're the Messiah. You are Israel's Messiah. But the thing is, is that 
he wasn't the Messiah in the way that they thought he should be. They never understood his real purpose. They thought he was going to free them from the tyranny of Rome and reestablish Israel as God's chosen people um, and that he would reign on the throne and it would be about, about them in their own kingdom, this kind of exclusive reality in which the pagan influence of the outside world would be forced out. That Jesus essentially would come and he would be a victorious dominating king who would conquer and push out the Roman Empire, but instead Jesus dies at the hands of his own people as a common criminal nailed to a cross. By the way, if you don't know much about crucifixion, the Romans used it. Uh, they, they found burial sites where um, of, of how often it was used by, by the Roman Empire to keep people from from rebelling against the rule of the empire. It was, a, it was a deterrent. But the Romans viewed themselves as so enlightened that the cross was disgusting to them. So it was a weird thing. They loved to use it to keep people in line, but they would not talk about it. They did not like to walk by it. The stench of allowing someone to hang on a cross uh, and, until they died could take sometimes up to a week the birds would feed on them. I mean, just, it, was, it would have been a horrific sight. The Romans wouldn't talk about it. They didn't look on it. There's, it's only written about a few times. Actually, in, Ro in almost all Roman literature, there's very few mentions of it. And yet, all four Gospels speak of the cross as well as the epistles of, of this is the way that Jesus was killed. And Jesus is a reminder that man cannot save himself. And the cross... The reason it is the central symbol of the Christian experience is because the cross, which is this ugly, I mean, it's weird. We wear crosses around our neck, which is, Thomas poses the questions. I think he often speaks the things that the others are thinking. You know, he ha he's not afraid to just say what's on his mind. I, and, and I think that's a, actually a beautiful quality. Uh, so many of us are so self-conscious about what others think that we don't, we're not honest. Uh, we're not honest with ourselves. We're not honest with our family and friends. We definitely can be dishonest with God. Thomas is a man, I think, that is honest. And, and Jesus does not rebuke Thomas for his request. This is a powerful picture, I believe, of faith as trust. Trust, it, it's, it's a gut level faith. And, and the, people ask me this all the time. When, when I first came to faith at 27 years old, I, didn't, I hadn't read the Bible in its entirety. I, I, I had so many issues. In fact, I was so convinced that I wasn't saved, I think I prayed the sinner's prayer for, like every day for the first two years just to make sure. I, like I, I lived with constant combination of belief and doubt, belief and doubt, uh, and, and that that blend uh, is is something that is it's a natural part of the human experience. Because here is the thing: one of my favorite um, Jewish thinkers, Joshua Abraham Heschel, uh, in his beautiful book *God's Search for Man*, said that we apprehend far more than we comprehend. That that faith can be. A, um, I knew, Darcy, you were going to shut that door because you are so cold. Uh, and I was cold, so thank you. I'm usually hot up here. Uh, so, but faith is something that it can be, is apprehended long before it's comprehended. That's why when we share the gospel, it's not like you have to understand the inner working, the, every theological argument around atonement. And there are many. It says that whoever confesses with their lips that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead shall be saved. It doesn't, there's no contingency on that statement. And there is something, I think a lot of people are like, I want to understand more before I, and of course, we're not asking for blind, Jesus isn't asking for blind faith. But we can't know all there is to know. It's a, it is, the life of faith is a, is a journey in which you grow in, and you mature in. And you come to deeper understanding as you move toward that reality. I, I, I think that this is a, a powerful statement. Uh, Richard Newhouse said, when our faith is weak, 
when we are assailed by contradictions and doubts, we are tempted to look at our faith, to worry about our faith, to try to work up more faith. At such times, however, we must not look to our faith, but look to Him. Look to Him, listen to Him, and faith will take care of itself. Keep looking, keep listening. Those of you who have been around Door of Hope for any length of time, I've often used the illustration of, of faith as a disposition toward an object that allows that object to do something for you. And if you think about faith in an airplane, when you get onto an airplane, you're not, you might actually have very little faith in the airplane. You might be terrified of flying. You might be worried about the fact that you're in, in, in a metal cylinder, you know, that, and we've seen way too many movies. I just watched another TV show around a group of soccer players that crash in the, in the Canadian Rockies. And I was like, in the, the, the scene of them crashing, it's like enough to make you never want to fly again. And remember that Jeff Bridges film that was it uh, invincible or whatever I can't remember what it is uh, but it, but I just remember like that is not helping my cause for flying watching movies about plane crashes but I still have the ability to get on. I know people that will not fly I'll get on a plane I just believe that the Holy Spirit on the plane comes in the form of Ambien um, <laughs> I sleep my way through the fear. Um, <laughs> no, I, I really am not afraid of flying anymore. And part of it is because I began to investigate what is turbulence, which is the thing that scared me, and saw how rare it is for turbulence to actually cause a plane to crash. And I talked to a pilot who said that turbulence is like a Jeep going off-road. It's actually meant to do it, but it doesn't feel good. It's not, it's not a pleasant thing, but I'm not, I wasn't fr once I understood the mechanics of it, I, I was no longer afraid. But it didn't change the fact, though, that I still had enough faith to get on the plane. And it didn't matter if I was sitting so next to someone that loved flying while I was terrified of flying. We both got to the same destination. The thing is, is that the amount of faith that we have in the object in which we place the faith defines the enjoyment of the trip. And I think that this is something that we need to understand. When we look here, Thomas is not a man without faith. He is he actually is a man of faith. He wouldn't be with the disciples if he didn't believe it at all. And he would have just said, I don't believe you. But he said, unless, which there is hope in that statement. It is a faith of the soul. He can't escape the conviction that Jesus was more than just a man. Even though he's struggling with the idea of it, he's still holding out hope. And I think that this is something that we need to understand. We often look at our faith and think, I just don't have enough faith. It's not about your faith, it's about Jesus. And he said that if anyone has the faith the size of a mustard seed, they could tell the mountain to jump into the sea because it's not the faith that matters, it's the object in which we place our faith. My dad had the same issue. My dad came to faith two years before he died, just two years ago, he just died a couple months ago. And his whole thing, I remember asking, I said, Dad, the chaplain told me that you prayed to receive Jesus. And, I, and he goes, yeah, I don't think it's stuck. And, uh, and I'm like, what? he goes, I, and I, I said, why? And he goes, because I can't do anything. I can't walk, I can't. So he, he, in his mind, I put faith in Jesus, but that means I have to do something. And I'm like, dad, there's nothing you can do. You're like the thief on the cross. Your fruit is just your yes. That's it. That's probably all there ever will be. You're not gonna stop drinking. You're not gonna stop smoking. It actually would kill you to stop drinking. And he said, he said, I go, do you, I go, you, you, do, you do believe? I said, his grace is stickier than your doubt. And he goes, I think you're right. And he goes, and then he asked me about calling God the big fella. And I was just, it's always like, I love that. My dad's simple faith it was a small faith. It was a brand new faith. He was like a baby Christian when he died. And, and, and he had doubts about it. Of course he did. Because inevitably, our thought process is, there's got to be something I have to do for God. But let me just remind you, everything that needs to be done has already been done in Jesus. The beautiful words of Martin Luther. Uh, and I think that this is the picture of grace. Grace is, is a one-way love that comes to you, not because you deserve it, but because God chooses to love you. It's his nature to do so. Don't focus on the weakness of your faith. Faith is trust. It's, it's, it is something that we apprehend 
often before we can fully comprehend. This is beautiful, though. Eight days later, we're told in verse 26, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. There's something that's worth noting about the resurrection body of Jesus, because he wasn't a ghost. In fact, in this same story, although we won't read this part of the text, he asked for food and eats fish with them. But at the same time, he isn't con- contained by the same laws of, of the human experience. He goes through walls without being held up by it. And I think this speaks, I think this is pointing us to a reality that often when we think of the resurrection, we think of it as resuscitation. But it's nothing like resuscitation. It is altogether new creation. Jesus being the firstborn over a new humanity. It's much more closely related, which is why it's a symbol that has been historically used in the church from its beginning, which is that of a butterfly. It's the picture of metamorphosis. If you know anything about butterfly, the metamorphosis of a butterfly um, from a caterpillar to a butterfly is that in my mind, you know, we think of the cartoons. It's just a caterpillar now with wings. But a butterfly looks nothing like a caterpillar because when they go into their little cocoon, uh, something happens. They actually dissolve down to a green liquid-like substance. Did you know that? It literally just looks like snot. And yet in that little snot pile, um, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> spent a lot of years wiping, wiping. I, my first job was at a daycare with two and three-year-olds, so I just have a lot of experience with this. Uh, in that little snot pile is, is all of the genes, all of the DNA of that caterpillar retransformed and, and put together in which it comes out as something totally new. And here's the thing, it even carries, they've, they've done all these studies that even though it turns into a puddle of mush and then comes out a butterfly, it carries with it memory of life as a caterpillar. It's the most incredible thing. But that new creation, that metamorphosis, this is why uh, it's, it's such a beautiful illustration of resurrection, that Jesus had a resurrected body, and they didn't recognize him often when he first appeared to them until he showed them the wounds in his hands, in his feet, in his side. And I think that this is speaking also toward the coming kingdom, that whatever the new heavens and new earth are are, uh, that are described in Scripture, it is like and not like what we are experiencing here. Um, And so here he appears, miraculously appears, And the first thing he says to them is, peace be with you. I've always loved that because whenever Jesus is in the middle, peace is the natural thing that follows. And we're told in Ephesians chapter 2 that Christ himself is our peace, who has torn down the middle wall of separation. And Jesus comes, and I believe that this had to have been a moment where faith, that gut level faith, Um, of Thomas where he's just holding on to hope now is faith as a scent it is it is intellectually taking hold he's looking at him he's hearing him speak and often that's the thing when the moment Jesus spoke was when the disciples seemed to immediately recognize him when he says to Mary in the garden woman why are you weeping and she thinks he's a gardener and then he says something and all of a sudden she's recognizes him as the Lord. When he's with the disciples on the road to Emmaus and he breaks the bread and prays, they immediately recognize it as the, Lord, as the Lord. And then he disappears from their presence. And they said, did not our hearts burn within us while he opened up the scriptures? It's a powerful picture of their, that Jesus brings to remembrance the intimacy. It tells us too that our intimacy with someone, uh, what we know of someone, how we know them, uh, is not necessarily defined by what we see. Um, is defined by who the person is in, the, in their, the depth of their being. But faith as assent is that intellectual assent, I am now convinced mentally that this faith is real. Faith, there is an, an aspect of faith that is, it's not just heart. It's heart, mind, soul, and strength. And I think that this is a powerful, a powerful thing because here Jesus says, peace be with you. And you can imagine Thomas who said, unless I do these things, but now he's looking at him. And it isn't Thomas who said, 
Yeah, I don't believe it until I do this. Because look where we move. We move to faith as obedience. It's Jesus who commands Thomas to come and to touch his hands and his side. It says, put your fingers here. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. This is a beautiful picture of faith as obedience. We don't obey to believe. We, we believe and obey. And that obedience is simply a movement toward Christ. Uh, it, is, it is this reality when Jesus was asked, what must we do to do the work of God in John chapter 6, verse 29? He says, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. But then what does he say? Come, pick up your cross and follow me. The counting of the cost. People ask me all the time, what does it cost to follow Jesus? It would be a lie to say anything less than everything. Because the whole aspect of saving faith is that you are now allowing Jesus to be the one who defines your existence. You are no longer the God of your own life, which is the great lie of modern civilization, which is that you are the creator of your own existence. You can do anything you put your mind to, but most people know for a fact that that is not true. You know, we listen to the voices of the 0.0009% that actually somehow by luck and probably hard work get to that one percentile of, of human achievement and then they become the gurus that tell all the rest of us that we can't, who can't even get to freaking base camp that, you know what, you can do it. Like me, if you do what I do, if you eat like I do, or if you invest like I do, you'll be a millionaire. You'll, you know, you'll have a six pack tomorrow. I'm like, whatever, dude. I'm selling my car and I'm getting liposuction. I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> the great... The great advocates of this, this incredible age of positive thinking. You're a bad A and you just don't know it. You seen that one? I want to say you're bad and an A and you should know it. And that's the reality of, of our human brokenness, our frailty. The, the fact that, it is, it, it, that we make terrible masters. Every time I have tried to be in control of my own life without the consideration of my wife or my kids, without my consideration of what God would have, I make a mess. And I don't think I'm unique in that. I think that much of human existence is marked by, by frustration, by anxiety. I think Thomas is one who clearly, by even the kind of questions he asked Jesus, he's anxious. He's an anxious person. Lord, we don't know where you're going. I'm an anxious person. I find great comfort in, in Thomas. I still want to throw up when I preach. Like, I've been doing it for like 20 years now, and I still feel sick when I do it. I'm an anxious person. But faith, my obedience to Jesus is this. I love him more than I am afraid of you. That's the essence of, of faith is obedience. I don't want to get up here, but I can't not do it. It was the same with music. I love making music. Don't get me wrong. It's not that I didn't want to be liked. It's not that I didn't want to find the approval of people. And especially before I was a believer, I wanted to be famous. But I was still terrified of it because I was far more consumed with the idea that I would be rejected. And so there are all things. I'm not saying I'm devoid of a desire to be a, of people liking me. That's just part of the human experience that we have to consistently learn to die to because when we live for the opinions of others, we are tormented human beings. Um, but here we find Jesus calling Thomas to himself. And the reason that I say that this is faith is obedience, which is that loving God with all your strength, it's not enough to just say, I believe Jesus exists. That's not saving faith. We're told that the demons recognized Jesus far before any of the humans did. It's a, it, the obedience is just the simple willingness to come to him. 
there's, there's movement, if you will. I would say the obedience, even it's like, if you believe in your heart, we're called to what? Actually do something physical. Confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord. We're called to confess our sins to one another with our lips. We're called to pick up our cross and follow him, which means that the Christian life is not meant to be static. We're actually going somewhere. All of these realities are aspects of what it means to live a life by faith. But it's, but it's, a, a, it's not a, I am doing this to, to get God's approval. It's I have God's approval, and the obedience flows out of the fact that God has already moved toward me and made himself known to me, that he loves me. And there are some days that you will not get up and you will not follow him. And it doesn't change anything that he has done for you. He still loves you. And it's that that brings the conviction. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance that causes us to change direction. Look what happens. For here you see faith as surrender. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. You know, there are lots of people that say, Jesus never claimed to be God. I just read this the other, the other day. Uh, I think it was uh, Riza Aslan um, who wrote a book on the life of Jesus, and he was not qualified to do so. Uh, and he, he actually puts all this emphasis on, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. But anyone that knows anything about the Jewish faith knows that God alone, Yahweh alone, was to receive worship. And Jesus was worshiped on many a times throughout his teaching itinerary. And the fact is, he never rejected it. <laughs> he always accepted it. The reason the Jewish leaders, religious leaders, wanted him dead is because he legitimately, if he was not God, by Jewish law, should be put to death, for he was portraying himself as one who is one with God. It's the whole reason they, they hate him. That's what they used against him. I think that it was far deeper and far more insidious than that because I think that they knew he was the Messiah, but we're told that those religious leaders were so desperately desiring to hold on to their position. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. The law had become their God, not the God who gave them the law. And that was a problem. But Jesus, who came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it, very well understood that man is not to receive worship that belongs to God himself. And does Jesus say, whoa, 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 you can't, you can't worship me? No, he receives the worship. And I think that this is, this is a beautiful part where Jesus says to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So much of our faith, there's so much. We, we think, I, people say all the time, I can't believe in a God I can't see. You ever watch Nacho Libra? I know, it's really great. I've really been missing that movie. Remember that scene where, he, uh, where Jack Black's character um, says to his friend, I just remember um, in, his, in the movie, he's called Steven. Um, he's like, he, uh, it's his wrestling partner, and he goes, have you ever been baptized? And he's like, he goes, he goes, I can't be baptized. I believe in science. And then Jack Black sneaks up behind him with a bowl of water and baptizes him really quick. <laughs> it like dunks his face in it. Um, but, but that's the thing is science, much of what we call science, what we're looking at, observable truth. I just finished reading a book on quantum mechanics and, and pure, as a novel. Uh, I, don't worry, I was not reading a book on quantum mechanics. I was reading a novel about the scientists who created theories that cannot be seen. Quantum mechanics actually can't be explained. It carries with it problems that no one, living or dead, has ever been able to answer. We just understand it enough that it's the basis for things like the internet, the self, but we don't understand it, and yet people believe in it. There's all kinds of it. It's funny to me how much, how many scientists believe in aliens. I was, list, I was in this book, one famous American mathematician um, said of Gothendijk, which is considered the greatest, the greatest mathematician in the 20th century, that when he lectured, I became convinced that he was sent to us from another, another alien world to help progress human civilization because he was so genius. It's, it's, we are willing to believe all sorts of crazy things. I was, remember talking, sharing the gospel with a guy on an airplane once, and he was like, 
he, he laughed at me when I told him I believed in Jesus. He goes, you believe that God died on, a, like, died on the cross? I go, yeah, what do you believe? And he goes, I believe that we are the children of an ancient alien civilization. I'm like, and I'm like, well, how do we get here? And then he had this whole theory that there was one point where another world you know, from some multi-dimension came close enough to earth that, you know, some people hopped over. I'm like, I, what? I feel like you're mixing up like the Chronicles of Narnia with, you know, with Scientology and a couple other things. I, and it was like, and, and he was so, and I realized like, this guy's crazy. And this was not a, this was not a good use of my time right now. Because he was yelling these things across, it was across the aisle. It was so, I actually was embarrassed. I was pretty embarrassed. <laughs> and, and then he was, he was like mentioning really obscure science fiction novels like that he thinks are like close to the truth. And I'm like, so you believe that, but you think what I believe is crazy. And that's the thing, I think people believe what they want to believe. And I also think that's why you can't convince someone to believe if they don't want to. I, remember when, when, uh, when Lazarus, um, uh, when Lazarus was, was, Jesus gives a parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and Lazarus, who is this poor man who, who when he dies, goes to be in, with God in, with Abraham's bosom, and he sees the rich man who's being tormented in some kind of hellish type of purgatory thing, and he says, send Lazarus over to give me a drink, and he says, he this gulf cannot be crossed. Abraham says to him, the gulf can't be crossed. And he says, well, at least send him back to my family to warn them of what's coming if they remain disobedient. And he says, your family has the law and Moses. If they won't believe that, they won't believe in a ghost. And I think that this is a picture of people believe what they want to believe. And people will have a way of dis of of saying what I experienced wasn't anything. If you talk with people that experience something that's out of the ordinary, they will all have different explanations for what happened. And the human mind wants to have observable, hard, concrete facts to define everything, but there is too much about human existence that sits outside of the ability to explain. We must understand that we are a people that live by faith every day. <laughs> Whether you believe in the God of the Bible or Jesus as the Son of God or not, you are still a person of faith. And I will also say this, you are still a person of worship, for everybody worships. Everybody worships. Worship is simply defined by that which captures the affections of your heart. You worship whatever it is you love the most. Whatever holds that center, that center. And if it's not God, there is nothing in this world Self-worship is the most unfortunately common and the most destructive because nothing is more heartbreaking than loving only yourself. This is one of the great definitions by David Foster Wallace in Consider the Lobster when he said, he said, the solipsist is one whose greatest fear is dying having only loved himself. And I think that this is one of those things that creates the smallness of human existence. How much larger would your world be if you were smaller in it, said G.K. Chesterton. And here, faith as surrender is seen as the essence of the Christian faith because Thomas answered him and his response was a total surrender. Worship you. It says, he says, my Lord and my God, whoever confesses with their lips that Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead shall be saved. He is a true follower of Jesus and he gives Jesus the rightful worship that Jesus deserves. The focus is not on himself, it's on Christ. So in closing, I think we need to understand this about doubt. In all of those stages of faith, when we think of faith, uh, when we think of, of faith as, as trust, when we think of faith as assent, when we think of faith as obedience, when we think of faith as surrender, when we think about what it means to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we need to know that in each one of those components, doubt will be a part of the experience. And the reason that is, is because we are, because of sin, as I like to say, and have been saying for a long time now, mixture. Sin is always at play. 
in our lives. Even as believers, sin is at play. And sin creates the, the unfortunate reality in which we can lose sight of God. We can begin, like me seeing the wolf, it's like I experienced this thing, but then it's gone all of a sudden. And some of you feel like all you've been experiencing is the silence of God. But let me remind you that you can't talk about the silence of God unless you've experienced his presence. It's like Graham Greene's novel, The End of the Affair, when at the end, the, uh, the main narrator says he hates God because God had taken the woman he loved from, um, from him. Uh, she dies, and I'm giving you the story. Uh, and and this, is so, this is so amazing. He's, he, he calls himself an atheist, but then there's this powerful moment where he says, I hate God for taking this woman from me. And then there's this light bulb that goes on. Wait, I couldn't hate him unless it was possible that I also could love him. To say that I hate God is to, is to actually acknowledge that I believe in him. And his conversion comes through his hatred toward God. What a powerful picture that part of the journey of faith is just believing that God is closer to you than you are to your own thoughts. That your existence is not chance. That you were divinely designed by one who wants to have intimacy and communion with you. That God is a God of love and Jesus is the absolute uh, and firm reminder that God is not willing to leave us in our brokenness, but was content to take that brokenness into himself, to identify with us, not only in our humanity, but in our sin as well, so that we can say that we have a God who understands. I can't worship a God that doesn't understand the human experience. He needs to know what it's like to enter into the suffering of a fallen world, and Jesus has done that. In Dorothy Sayers' words, whatever game God has played, he has played fair and taken his own medicine. He understands the frailty of our lives, and he loves you. Look at this last quote from, John, from Richard John Newhouse from Death on a Friday Afternoon. Jesus does not reject any who turn to him. At times we turn to him with a little faith, at times with a mix of faith and doubt, when more sure of the doubt than of the faith, Jesus is not fastidious about the quality of faith. He takes what he can get, so to speak, and gives immeasurably more than he receives. He takes our faith more seriously than we do and makes of it more than we ever could. His response to our faith is greater than our faith. I like it. George MacDonald said something similar when he said, Doubts are the messengers of the living one to the honest. They are the first knock at the door of things that are not yet, but have to be understood. Doubts must precede every deeper assurance. That has been true of my own walk with the Lord, is that there are things I don't doubt anymore. I never doubt the reality of God or the reality of Jesus as the Messiah. I never, I never doubt the assurance of my salvation. But what I can doubt is that he really loves me right now. I think he'll save me, but he's got to be pretty disappointed in me. He's pretty bummed with me. He's frustrated with me. So my doubts tend to be around what God thinks of me, which tells me that my doubts are also around what I think of God. What is God like? And sometimes we apply the grid of our own earthly fathers to, to God and you had, a, you had a tough dad, and you're like, that's what God is like. He's sort of me. He's just constantly giving you spankings. But I don't think God's in the business of cosmic child abuse. What I think he is is that he's a gracious God who is consistently not giving us what we deserve. Instead, he's giving us what he always is trying to give us, which is himself. And that's the greatest gift that he can give. You guys, Jesus is the son of God. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead, and he's crazy about you. And he's inviting you today. If anyone puts their faith in me, they'll be saved. Whoever believes in the Son, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's like little children. We begin somewhere. 
You don't understand everything, but do you believe in the depths of your being? Maybe you can't even explain why, that there's something about this Jesus that's worth following. That's what brought me to faith at 27 years old. I couldn't escape the allure of Jesus. That was what it was all about. I also am very aware that nothing is more offensive uh, to the ears of modern man than the name of Jesus. It's a strange dichotomy. It's a strange thing. People talk about God all day long. You talk about Jesus and people get uncomfortable. It's because there's power in the name. It's because he's real. It's because he loves you. It's because he's pursuing you. In every move you make toward him, he is already previous. You are here today because his spirit drew you. And he wants you to know him and to be known by him. So, let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. I just thank you for your gospel. I thank you that you are the God who loves, who gave himself for us. Thank you that you entered in to the brokenness of this world, that you have chosen to love sinners in their sin. More than that, you who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Lord, the power of the gospel is that it is not based upon what we do for you, but simply our willingness to believe and to accept what you have already done for us. Lord, the gospel is about saying yes to the yes that you have proclaimed over this broken world through your son Jesus. Your word says that in in the days of old, you spoke through the prophets and through the Holy Scriptures, but in these last days, you have spoken to us in and through your Son. Jesus, you are called the anchor of the soul, the sympathetic high priest, the trailblazer who has gone before us and made a way that you restored the separation between man and God and the enmity that the judgment we deserve was handled once and for all by you, for you are both the judge and the judged in our place. And so we just want to pray today. There might be some here who don't know you, who've never taken that next step of faith and just said, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Make me new. And I, what I'd like to do, church, I think this is a, a really beautiful way, is that if we could just pray together out loud. You know, there's no print, sinner's prayer in Scripture, but it is fully biblical, everything that is prayed in what is commonly called the sinner's prayer. And I just want you guys to pray out loud with me after these things. So as I say this, I want you to repeat these words. And we can just do this as a way, maybe there's someone here who wants to pray this for the first time, that we as the body can be uh, carriers of grace as we walk our brothers and sisters who are here through this beautiful reality. So just pray after me these words. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would come into our hearts, that you would cleanse us of our sins, that you would give us your Holy Spirit and make us new. Lord Jesus, I know that I have sinned against you. But I believe that you dealt with my sin upon the cross of Calvary. I accept your forgiveness and ask that you would help me to know you to follow you and to love you for all the days of my life. Jesus, you are Lord. Amen. Amen. Hey friends, this is Russ Lacey, one of the pastors here at Door of Hope Southeast. Thanks for listening to this teaching. We always want to encourage you to give to your local church and would never want to supplant that. 
But if you're a regular listener and would like to help our church as we seek to point people to Jesus and minister here in the city of Portland, we'd welcome your prayers and financial support. Just head over to dooroforhopepdx.org and click Give from the menu bar. May God bless you.